Monday, January 4th, 2016. 20-year-old Todd Ezra Cook is spending some time with his cousin, Nathan Cook, at his aunt's home on Edgar Avenue in Petersburg, West Virginia. As is typical of the wintertime in the Potomac Highlands, the early morning is cold, dark, and still. Sometime after midnight, a neighbor reports hearing three gunshots, but is unsure of their origin. Moments later, a pickup truck roars out of the alleyway behind the Cook's home. At around 8.30 a.m., Todd Cook is found dead in the same alleyway behind his aunt's home. He had not been shot, and the mystery as to just what happened on that frigid morning continues to this day. From the outset, the death of Todd Cook has been a confusing and frustrating affair. No fewer than three manners of death were reported to Todd's family in the first two months, ranging from suicide to accidental overdose to its current status, undetermined. Conflicting clues at the crime scene, along with unfortunate delays, rampant rumors, and possible human error, have only served to deepen the mystery. For those who knew and loved Todd, the objective is quite simple. They want to learn what happened, and they feel quite certain that someone, possibly local, holds the answer. Todd Ezra Cook was born in Petersburg, West Virginia on September 13, 1995. When he was three years old, his parents separated, and Todd went to live with his paternal aunt and uncle, Larry and Marlene Nelson, in cabins, a small community in western Grant County. By all accounts, his childhood was a normal one. He loved sports, especially basketball, and his siblings have described him as an avid online gamer. Todd graduated from Petersburg High School in 2014 and later found work in various construction fields at local power plants. Todd also found himself facing the same temptations encountered by most teenagers and young adults. Though he rarely consumed alcohol, Todd's family and friends have openly acknowledged that he was a social user of marijuana, though he was never known to have gotten into trouble as a result of his drug use. However, in the days and weeks leading up to his death, rumors began to circulate that Todd may have begun experimenting with or possibly distributing somewhat harder drugs like LSD. In April of 2015, Todd's paternal uncle, Clyde Cook, was killed in an auto accident, and Todd was reportedly quite shaken by the tragedy. At the time, his family had no way of knowing that this would be the first of four deaths within the family over the next year or so. A generally private person by nature, Todd rarely spoke of his emotions or his life away from home, but some recalled that he had seemed somewhat depressed during December of 2015. Todd did impart that he felt a sense of guilt over his Uncle Clyde's death having driven him to his car on the night that he died. Around the same time, Todd struck up a friendship with a local girl, a friendship which eventually bloomed into something deeper. By January of 2016, she was generally regarded as Todd's girlfriend, though it remains unclear just how steady or solid the relationship actually was. For legal as well as safety reasons, we cannot use this person's real name. However, the young lady, who we will call Jane, herself described her relationship with Todd as, quote, more than friends, end quote. Todd spent the night of January 2nd, 2016 at Jane's residence. 
Jane had recently ended a reportedly abusive relationship, which had resulted in damage to both her person and her residence. Todd, described as someone who always loved to assist, was helping Jane mend both body and home. Fearing possible retribution from Jane's ex-boyfriend, she and Todd opted to keep the true nature of their relationship on the QT. According to Jane, January 3rd, 2016 started late for both she and Todd, and each slept in until around noon. Jane stated that she and Todd spent most of the day together at her home near Seneca Rocks. Later in the day, Todd advised Jane that he was driving into Petersburg. He reportedly stated that he was going to visit his father's home to take a shower and then visit his cousin Nathan. Nathan Cook's mother, Debbie, lived on Edgar Avenue in Petersburg, not far from Todd's father. Though Nathan now lived at another residence, he maintained a small garage at the rear of the family home. Todd left Jane's home sometime in the late afternoon and drove into Petersburg. Todd's own vehicle had been totaled in an accident, so he was driving a 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee, which belonged to his uncle, Larry Nelson. According to his cousin Nathan, Todd arrived at what is commonly called the garage, a small frame structure located behind his mother's home and along an alleyway known as Thompson Lane. According to statements later provided to investigators, Todd arrived at the garage between 4.30 and 5 p.m. All parties involved have described the garage in Petersburg as a general hangout for Todd, Nathan, their friends and family, and it was not unusual for them to remain there for hours at a time. According to later accounts, Nathan and Todd spent most of their time that day cutting wood and planing a door for Nathan's bedroom. Nathan advised that Todd's Jeep Grand Cherokee was low on gas. At some point, Nathan left the garage and drove to a nearby gas station. He returned with fuel for his tractor and Todd's vehicle, but later advised that Todd did not put any gas into his Jeep. Despite this, Todd later drove across town and returned with a mutual acquaintance, Casey Swick, referred to by most as Hoopy. The three remained at the garage for several hours, talking, drinking, and smoking. Nathan later stated that Todd smoked just one bowl of marijuana and drank just one beer while at the garage. Curiously, Nathan also reported that Todd was carrying a small amount of LSD as well. Nathan found this odd, both because Todd rarely partook of drugs stronger than marijuana, and also because acid is just not in common use or general demand in the area. Casey Swick left the garage between 9.30 and 10 p.m. and walked to the home of Todd's biological father, Mark Cook, to return a laser pointer that Nathan had borrowed. Just why Casey made this trek as opposed to Todd himself is a matter of divided opinion. Nathan himself left the garage at approximately 10.30 p.m. As he was exiting the alleyway which passes the garage, he noticed and spoke with Casey Swick, who was on his way back to Todd. Nathan advised Casey that Todd was still back at the garage and had been instructed to lock up when he left, as per their usual arrangement. Nathan did not return to the garage that night, and what transpired over the next six to eight hours is also the subject of fierce conjecture. As such, we will discuss the various accounts of the following hours later in this feature. The following day, January 4th, 2016, dawned bitterly cold. Around 8.30 a.m., Todd's aunt, Deborah Cook, went into her backyard to get some firewood. When she got to the back porch, she glanced into the alleyway and noticed that Todd's Jeep was still parked near the garage. Just to the left, she spied Todd himself, laying face down in the alleyway. 
Deborah Cook has advised that her first instinct was that Todd had become intoxicated and simply passed out. She went to the alleyway, intending to rouse him, but instead found him cold and completely unresponsive. Deborah called her son Nathan as well as 911. She was still on the line with Grant County 911 when Nathan arrived about five minutes later. 911 advised Nathan and Deborah to administer artificial respiration. Nathan rolled Todd onto his back and attempted CPR, but to no avail. At first glance, the crime scene appeared to tell an all-too-tragic story. A young man lying dead with a pistol at his feet. First impression? Suicide. However, in this instance, the story being told was not at all accurately reflected by the book's cover. The following sequence includes actual photos taken at the crime scene. Although far from graphic or gruesome, some may find the following images disturbing. However, in this instance, the crime scene and what was found there is one of the few undisputed aspects of this whole case. Mysterious WV has therefore opted to include these images in an appropriately censored and respectful form. Sadly, no photographs of the scene were taken before Todd's body was rolled over. Deborah Cook initially found Todd lying on his stomach with his feet pointed towards the garage. His skin was pale and his lips were blue. Curiously, Todd's eyes were a nearly solid shade of red, suggesting that most, if not all, of the blood vessels in his eyes had burst. One of Todd's pistols, a 22 caliber Ruger Mark III, was laying on the ground near his feet, and one spent shell casing lay several feet away from Todd's head. Equally curious, both of Todd's shoes were off his feet, and each were laying near to the wrong foot. Deborah Cook had also noticed both dirt and wood chips on Todd's back before he had been rolled over. Todd's ball cap was also found, originally lying at his left side. A lanyard which contained the remote key to Todd's Jeep was found beside him, torn. A glass bowl, the kind commonly used for smoking marijuana, was also found under Todd once he was rolled over. Further frustrating an already emotional scene, law enforcement had a great deal of difficulty in finding a medical examiner to respond to the crime scene. Members of the Petersburg Police Department put calls in to three separate counties but were unable to locate an M.E. As a result, Todd's lifeless body remained at the scene until well after noon when it was removed to the Besagic Funeral Home and later sent to Charleston for an official autopsy. Also around this time, one of the more unfortunate incidents related to this case occurred. Todd's uncle, Larry Nelson, had been informed of his death and came to the crime scene. Upon his arrival, one of the officers present addressed Mr. Nelson and reportedly told him point-blank that Todd had shot himself. This hasty report was not reversed until two days later, followed up by an official apology by Petersburg Chief of Police Darius Stark. Stark was quoted as saying, quote, I'm sorry we told you that. It's just what we thought, end quote. Back at the garage, Officer G.L. Campbell conducted interviews and, along with Deputies Joe Kreitz and Ryan Howard of the Grant County Sheriff's Department, began general processing of the scene. In his report, Campbell notes that he was eager to have a gunshot residue test performed, but was unable to secure any kits from either the Petersburg Police or from Grant County. Campbell obtained permission to enter the garage, but found only a bottle of Crown Royal whiskey and a near-empty Gatorade bottle. Campbell next entered Todd's Jeep. Within the Jeep, Campbell noted the following items. A green plastic case for the 22 caliber Ruger Mark III found at Todd's feet. 
a red plastic container with nine Anison tablets inside, a gray plastic case containing a small set of scales, noted as the type often used in the weighing of drugs, a black canvas holster manufactured by Gunnate, one Standard Arms 9mm Luger pistol unloaded, one magazine for the Standard Arms 9mm pistol loaded with six spear brand hollow point rounds, one black plastic gun case containing a stainless steel handy rifle manufactured by New England Firearms and with an attached Simmons 6x24 scope. The following items were found on Todd's person while at the crime scene. One double-bladed buck pocket knife with a white handle. Todd's wallet and identification. One blue lanyard containing the remote control for Todd's Jeep. Later, the following items were found on Todd's person while it was at the Besagic funeral home. A small chrome tool described as the type often used while smoking marijuana. A small black and silver magnifying glass. A Winchester double-bladed pocket knife with a brown handle. A flip-top pack of Marlboro Red cigarettes with eight cigarettes missing a small empty foil packet, and one black cylindrical case approximately five inches long and one inch in diameter made of some kind of tape. Officer Campbell contacted the medical examiner's office in Charleston and requested that a gunshot residue test be performed during the autopsy. Four days later, on January 8th, the medical examiner's office contacted Officer Campbell and reported that a small piece of glass had been found in the back of Todd's throat as well as in his eyes. They also reported that Todd's body indicated that the cause of death may have been asphyxiation. The piece of glass was subsequently identified as having come from the glass bowl found under Todd's body by Nathan and Deborah Cook. A canvas of the neighborhood around the crime scene turned up at least one promising lead. A neighbor who resided on nearby Rig Street reported that while carrying firewood into his home, he had heard three gunshots sometime between 12.30 and 1.30 a.m. on January 4th. The neighbor added that shortly thereafter, he observed an older model Ford Ranger exit the alleyway at a high rate of speed and pull onto Rig Street. Unfortunately, the neighbor could not recall in which direction the truck turned. Officer Campbell interviewed several persons of interest, but noted that he was unable to obtain little more than second and third hand information concerning any potential foul play. Everything about the crime scene, however, appeared suspicious, and this was noted quite clearly in Officer Campbell's first report. After the first ten days, authorities seemed to have reached a point of suspended animation as they awaited the results of a toxicological report from the medical examiner. When it arrived on February 8, 2016, the final determination came as a surprise and also became another fierce point of contention between law enforcement and Todd's family. The toxicology report revealed signs of methamphetamines, amphetamines, THC, and marijuana metabolite, or carboxy-THC, in Todd's system. The official cause of death was listed as methamphetamine intoxication, essentially an overdose. The official autopsy also noted tunneling of Todd's left anterior descending coronary artery. Todd's family were indignant and felt there had been a rush to judgment. Following additional investigation and a re-evaluation of the available as well as newly provided evidence, the state medical examiner's office amended their report of February 16th. On March 25, 2016, the death of Todd Cook was officially changed from methamphetamine intoxication to undetermined. In addition, the pathological findings were amended to note that the evidence present suggested the possibility of assault. 
Specifically, the amended report noted conjunctival petechi, evidence of a compression to the neck or throat, glass in Todd's throat and on his face, suspicious circumstances. The amended findings of the medical examiner's office remain on the record as the cause of death. Even before the arrival of the initial autopsy findings, Todd's adoptive father, Larry Nelson, engaged the services of an independent private investigating agency to probe deeper into the circumstances surrounding his death. Through a combination of personal interviews, crime scene analysis, and electronic forensics, the investigators were able to shed far more light on the events leading up to and following Todd's death. Just what happened to Todd Cook between 11.30 p.m. on January 3rd and 8.30 a.m. on January 4th? Where had he been? What had he done? Who had he been with? Had he been threatened? Had he chosen to partake of stronger, more dangerous narcotics? What follows is based on information obtained by the Petersburg Police Department during their initial interviews, follow-up interviews conducted by licensed private investigators, and electronic forensic examinations performed by the independent investigative agency. At approximately 10.30 p.m., Nathan Cook left the garage and drove down the alleyway towards Rig Street. Todd remained behind. Nathan met Casey Swick, who was returning from a brief errand to the home of Todd's biological father, Mark. Nathan advised Casey that Todd was back at the garage waiting for him. Casey Swick reported that he walked back down to the garage and asked Todd if he could give him a ride to his mother's home on South Mill Creek Road. According to Casey's statement to Officer Campbell, Todd drove first to the 7-Eleven convenience store about a half a mile away. Here, Casey Swick entered the station and, with the $20 Todd's father had given him, purchased a pack of Marlboro Red cigarettes in a flip-top box. The remainder of the cash was used to put fuel in Todd's Jeep. The following day, Todd's father noted that the Jeep contained just under one-half tank of gas, consistent at the time with a fuel purchase of approximately $15. Once his vehicle was refueled, Todd drove Casey to his mother's home on South Mill Creek Road. Casey later recalled that he invited Todd to come inside, but Todd declined, stating that he was going back to the garage, and he jokingly quipped that he was, quote, going to see what kind of trouble I can get into, end quote. The time was approximately 11.30 p.m. By all known accounts, this was the last time Todd Ezra Cook was seen alive. Todd's exact movements over the next five or so hours are unclear. What is known is that Todd kept in touch by voice and text with both Jane and another female friend throughout most of the evening and morning. As this other friend has also expressed concern for her personal safety, her name also must be withheld. For the purposes of this narrative, we will simply call her Mary. Mary later reported that she and Todd talked and joked by text throughout the early morning hours. Around 4 a.m., Todd is reported to have called Mary and asked if she wanted to go for a drive. Mary accepted Todd's offer and asked him to give her 15 minutes. Todd advised that he would pick Mary up at Carl's Deli on the western end of Petersburg. Approximately 20 to 30 minutes later, Todd again called Mary and told her that he was, quote, just walking out the door now, end quote. An instant later, according to Mary, she heard Todd exclaim, damn it, followed by an unidentified male voice which stated, quote, get him, followed by a set of initials. At that moment, the line went dead. Mary proceeded to Carl's Deli, but Todd never showed up. No additional calls or texts from Todd were received. 
It should be noted at this juncture that in her statement to police on January 9, 2016, Mary made no mention of this last, somewhat dramatic call, simply stating that her last telephonic communication with Todd came at approximately 4.30 a.m. In addition, Mary also advised Officer Campbell that the phone she had been using on January 4th had not been working well. At some point between January 4th and January 9th, Mary purchased a new cellular phone and erased the messages from her old one. Eleven days later, when she spoke with the private investigators, Mary stated that she was fearful for her own safety. By this time, rumors had begun to circulate about what may have happened to Todd. One of the persons of interest named in these rumors was reportedly seeking to identify Mary and trace her through her telephone number. Mary had reported that her last communication with Todd came at approximately 4.30 a.m. Approximately four hours later, Todd was found dead outside of the garage behind Deborah Cook's home. Officer Campbell arrived on the scene within 30 minutes and noted that Todd's body was already in a state of full rigor mortis. This observation is corroborated by the crime scene photos, which show Todd's left leg drawn up, his right arm raised, and the fingers on both his right and left hand tightly retracted. According to an article in the Journal of Forensic Sciences and Criminal Investigation, Rigor mortis during the winter time can take as long as two to three hours to begin and an additional four to six hours to fully set in. According to data provided by weatherunderground.com, the temperature in Petersburg, West Virginia during the early morning of January 4, 2016 hovered right around 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Six to nine hours. And yet, only four hours are believed to have elapsed from the time Todd died to when his body was found. Could Mary have been mistaken about the time? Also, assuming that the information is accurate, what are we to make of Mary's account concerning her last telephone call from Todd? Could Mary have heard the onset of a physical altercation, perhaps even an assault? Small-town deaths invariably set the rumor mill running on all eight cylinders, and the case of Todd Cook is no exception. While based almost entirely on hearsay and conjecture, one rumor in particular has consistently surfaced over the years. Succinctly, the most persistent rumor concerning Todd's death runs along these lines. Todd dropped Casey Swick off at his mother's and either returned to the garage immediately or drove around. An individual or individuals later joined Todd at the garage. One of these individuals, a known person of interest, had intentions of harming or killing Todd. The motive, as with most violent crimes, drugs, money, jealousy, or some combination of all three. An altercation ensues with little physical contact. Todd is surprised from behind. He fires his 22 caliber pistol three times, either in self-defense or as a signal for help. Todd is swiftly immobilized and suffocated, possibly by a plastic bag being placed over his head. The killer or killers speed away in a pickup truck and are seen pulling onto Rig Street by the neighbor carrying in firewood. Again, this scenario is a composite of known facts, educated guesses, and oft-repeated rumors related by more than one individual. It is by no means definitive or free from its own contradictions. To wit, Todd is supposedly immobilized and suffocated and yet, the autopsy indicates no swelling or occlusions to Todd's mouth and nose, nor any foam or mucus buildup in the airways, only the ruptured ocular blood vessels. If Todd died around 4.30 a.m., as law enforcement believes, and fired his pistol during an assault, why did a neighbor report hearing gunshots between 12.30 and 1.30 a.m.? Again, 
Could this person have simply been mistaken about the time? Only one spent shell casing was recovered from the crime scene. If Todd fired three times, where are the other two ejected casings? And one final curious detail. Todd Cook stood just under six feet, four inches tall. At the time of his death, Todd was driving a Jeep Grand Cherokee, which belonged to his uncle, Larry Nelson. Larry was a good deal shorter than Todd, and recalled that he always had to readjust the driver's seat after Todd had been using the car. Yet, when he came to remove the Jeep from the alleyway behind Ebra Cook's home, the driver's seat was already in a position which required no adjustment. Had someone else been driving Todd's car? Someone closer in height to Larry? Questions, questions, and more questions. As of November 2019, there have been no arrests and no public identification of any suspects or persons of interest. Not everyone is on the same page when it comes to the manner of Todd's death. Some still believe that he died either of an overdose or a physiological reaction to some kind of drug. The medical examiner's office is not certain just what happened, only that it is undetermined. Others, including members of Todd's family, his friends, and the private investigators feel certain that he met with some kind of foul play. Whatever the cause, these questions demand answers, and there are many who feel that there are those in and around the Petersburg area who know what happened, but are afraid to speak out. For now, all we know for certain is that a young man is dead, a family devastated, and many, many questions still unanswered. Todd Ezra Cook was last seen alive at approximately 11.30 p.m. on January 3, 2016. At around that time, he dropped off his friend Casey Swick at his mother's home on South Mill Creek Road. Over the next few hours, Todd communicated off and on by voice and text with at least two female friends. At around 4 a.m., he made tentative plans to meet with one of these women at Carl's Deli in Petersburg. Todd is reported to have called her at around 4.20 or 4.30 a.m. and stated that he was on his way. Todd's friend later reported that she next heard what could have been the beginning of an altercation before the call abruptly ended. At 8.30 a.m., Todd was found dead in the alleyway behind 16 Edgar Street, about five feet in front of his 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee, and very near to the garage where he had spent much of the previous day. According to the official report from the Petersburg Police Department, Todd's body was in a state of full rigor mortis when it was found. The cause of death was originally listed as methamphetamine intoxication, but was later changed by the medical examiner's office to undetermined. Police and Todd's family would be very interested in hearing from anyone who may have seen Todd between the hours of 11.30 p.m. on January 3rd and approximately 4.30 a.m. on January 4th, 2016. During this time period, Todd was dressed in blue denim jeans, a navy blue hooded sweatshirt, blue shorts beneath his jeans, and a blue t-shirt beneath the sweatshirt, two white metal necklaces with crosses, a white metal bracelet and a black rubber bracelet on his right wrist, and a white metal bracelet and a green rubber bracelet on his left wrist. During this time, Todd would have been driving a gray 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee, West Virginia license number OL7829.
Thank you.